the main importance of lecture is the one is the psychology going into a last round game. And so in many situations, you're either tied for first or trailing by half a point. And the dynamic changes a lot depending on your uh, situation heading into the game. And the reason, one of the main reasons I thought of this lecture topic was I was recently playing in the New York International. And going to the last round, I had six out of eight. And uh, Gata Komsky had six and a half out of eight. And he had the black pieces, and he made a very quick draw. And I, I, I kind of expected that to happen. So with six out of eight myself, and with the white pieces, I was like, well, what do I do? Do I take the safe route and steer the game to drawish territory and make a draw and take some money home? Or do I do the, the brave thing and try to win and tie for first? I tried to win. I lost. Um, and I won't show you guys that game because um, yeah, I mean, it was very interesting, but I do have some better examples, I think. Um, but it really made me think about what changes when you're playing in the last round. And there are a couple of things you should never do. One, if you're trying to win the tournament, don't take an eight-move draw. Um, two, you shouldn't be scared. And that, that's always um, the trade-off is playing a bit of riskless chess in order to get a stable position, but maybe not enough chances to actually win the game. And the very important three is don't play suicidal chess, which is I'm going to try to attack you with everything I've got. And once your opponent repels, now you're in big trouble. So I have two games in mind of my own. Um, the first one is actually from here in St. Louis, the 2009 US Chess Championship. Going into the final round, Hikaru Nakamura and I were tied for first place with six out of eight. And back then, I was a grandmaster elect. I officially was an international master. I just made my third norm. And I was having the tournament in my life. Um, left and right, I kind of was surprising even myself and achieved an amazing performance. And in round eight, actually, I was playing Yuri Shulman, who was the 2008 US champion. I'm sure you all have seen his games and maybe met him in person because he's been in St. Louis many, many times. Um, and he had four and a half out of seven going into the eighth round. I had um, five out of seven. And as the rain, I was white, and as the reigning champion, uh, I knew that you know, this is almost like a last round game for him in many senses, because in order to compete for first place, he had to beat me. And as white, I played. Um, I actually don't have that game uh, prepared for this lecture, but what I did was essentially I traded on d5, and which is very much known to be quite um, allowing black very solid play, almost um, equality more or less in, in very simple fashion because you're trading and um, it's, it's very simple. And the reason I did that was because I knew that he needed to beat me, and it was really a. a a mental ploy was that, OK, let, let him come at me. And he eventually did. Um, he tried really hard. I castled queenside. He tried to attack me on the queenside. It didn't really work out. And he was slightly worse for the majority of the game. And he eventually blundered. And I won that game. Um, and I'm going to show you the round nine game, which was the follow-up game where I was playing Varuja and Akobian. Um, and I had the white pieces. And he was half a point behind me, I believe. Um, and Hikaru and I were tied for first. Hikaru was playing Grandmaster Josh Friedel. Hikaru ended up winning the game um, quite effortlessly, unfortunately, for me. And I drew my game. And I was very disappointed with myself after the match because I realized that I was doing the timid thing. I was playing very, very solid chess in a way that um, I think I don't typically play. Um, Gregory Kedanov, Grandmaster Kedanov, had a very good quote, I think, and sums up my chess um, style very well. I played him in the 2011 US Championship. That was two separate round robin events. I believe at the time I was three out of four. I was in first place on my side of the round robin. And the top two from each round robin moved on. I round robins of eight people. And Grisha, he goes after the game, well, I thought Robert was just trying to make a draw. And I realized too late that he was just trying to get a position and outplay me. And you know, what happened in that game was it was about level position, but I had maybe slightly easier plans. And I ended up winning that game. Um, but more importantly, it, it goes to show Sometimes when people say the position is, is a draw, it's not a draw. It might be objectively equal. But if you have opportunities to continue playing, that's of utmost importance. And the game I'm about to show against a Kobian, I kind of went against my own principles. And I didn't give myself many options to win. So in this game, he played the French defense. And I continued with knight c3, very um, typical knight f6, bishop g5. And back when Var was exclusively a French player, he played this opening a lot. And I captured knight takes e4, right, using the pin of the, 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 you know, the knight is pinned to the queen on d8. 
So in this game, Var went knight d7. And I went knight f3, a normal developing move, and he went h6. So I actually played Var again the next year in 2010 US Championship. And I'll show a bit of that game um, that I ended up winning. But in the first game in 2009, for all, all the marbles, the US Championship on the line, I made the move bishop h4, which I came to regret immediately afterwards. Just to show you the 2010 version of our, our match, I went bishop e3, bishop d6. And none of these moves are particularly forced. It's not that you know, we're still in the early stages, but it goes to show the, the kind of the mindset I was in. And this is one of my examples of how not to play uh, for a last round win. This, this game in uh, 2010 was not in the last round, but uh, I was white. So I, I was just trying to gain space, gain some initiative, um, while he was trying to get his, um, his pieces out. And bishop b7, for example, looks very tempting, but you get your king stuck in the center after move like bishop b5 check, because you can't uh, block the check with any of your pieces. So he had, was forced to castle. I went queen f3. Knight d5, c4. It looks like it might actually win the piece because uh, the, the knight is pinned to the rook on a8. But realistically, he can make a few trades. And after knight takes e3, um, my bishop on d3 is actually hanging. So I can't take the rook on a8. Other, otherwise, I fall into a simple queen takes d3. And my king is very weak. And uh, material, materially speaking, it's also not bad at all for black. And black should just be winning uh, in this position. So I took with the queen on e3, bishop b7, and I castle queen side. So this was, the, again, the 2010 version. Um, this was not a game of, I mean, it was in the US championship, so of course it was an important game. But for the standings of the tournament, it wasn't any uh, monumental game. But the point being is, OK, he can't take on g2 because it opens the g file. Um, and also, it allows for the near uh, future discovery with bishop h7 check, where the queen is on pre. So that is an impossible move. He went queen e7, and I went rook hg1. And the game continued, rook d8, and I just went g4. So as you can tell by the moves I've made, it, it was kind of a simple opening, nothing too drastic. It's not a, a sharp Sicilian by any means. But I was in a fighting mood that day. I was really trying to get that win. and. And he didn't handle it the best way. He went f6. And after it takes, queen takes, I went g5. And already we see that white is clearly um, doing quite well. The black king feels very unsafe. And I, you know this was actually, the game went up quite a bit longer. I won a pawn and it won in a, in a rook ending. But the point still, um, still holds that in this particular game, I was very ambitious. I tried to open the position. I tried to uh, create play for myself. And it was something that the next year, and again, this is the 2010 version of, of Hesekovian, I was very proud of the way I played, very importantly. And I thought that I created a lot of problems for him, made his position quite difficult. And you know, just a, a brief um, analysis of the position, we see the g7 pawn is, like I said, is a huge target. The e6 pawn is weak. And white's king is a lot happier than its black counterpart. Um, so. Yeah, this was the 2010 version, and, and now I'm going to go back because, um, while you know, again, while I won that game and it was very, I was very happy about it. The 2009 version was not nearly as exciting, and I really regretted it after the fact because I took myself out of true contention of winning the game and tying for first place. So I dropped back with bishop h4. Again, it's a very normal, we're still in the opening, a very natural um, drop back. And var went c5. So he's trying to trade queens, really uh, liquidate the position. And if the position gets so liquidated, white does not have many chances to win the game. And I decided to go c3, trying to solidify my pawn center. But it realistically, white's not getting much out of this line. Cd4, knight takes d4, and bishop e7. So black is developing with ease. White is still a bit underdeveloped. And the resulting position, we'll see a queenside majority for white, two pawns on the queenside for black, three for white. Um, but black is super solid, no real weaknesses to uh, exploit or even attack. And so um, the game continued. Bishop d3, eh, not exactly the most challenging of moves, castles. Bishop c2. So I'm going for some kind of vague hope of queen d3 and creating a battery to you know, go for a checkmate. But realistically, the position is not as good. And he immediately took that out of the cards with going e5. And so what happened was knight f5, bishop takes, bishop takes. And we see the resulting position. OK, black can trade queens if he so chooses. 
And white doesn't really have much of a choice. Yes, white has the two bishops temporarily, which we tend to like in open positions. But in the game, um, in, in this particular game, again, very disappointing for me. Well, I didn't have much of a choice to trade queens. And he went g6. I took the knight on f6 because my bishop isn't doing much. And we already see that, yeah, white has a bishop on e4, but the opposite color bishops. And this falls very much in line with the Sinkfield Cup round four. We saw so many games today with opposite color bishops uh, draws. I think four out of the five games, you know, the four that ended in a draw were all opposite color bishops um, with neither side having any real chances. Um, and in this particular game, I tried my best. I went, moved, um, we played probably 20 plus more moves and I was aiming for something, but it was really nothing. And so just to show you the rest of this one before we get into the more exciting second game, my game against Yuri Shulman, um, it just goes to show that already we've made not that many moves and the, the position is so liquidated that white's winning chances are really off the board. And again, this was a, the, the tournament standing was, I had six out of eight, Hikaru Nakamura had six out of eight, and Hikaru won his game, and that put more pressure on me. And back then, I wasn't as confident, I guess, and I wasn't as sure of myself in playing for a win against such a strong grandmaster like Verruja Nakobian. So instead, I opted for this variation, and it left leaves White with you know not many winning chances. I mean, if you just look at the, the position, the bishop on f6 is worse than his counterpart on e4, but the only target is b7, and after the move rook d8, I can't even take on b7 um, because after we trade rooks, he simply goes rook to b8, regaining b2. And in fact, now all of a sudden, black is in a better position. So he really just so super easily traded off the pieces. And you know, having the white pieces is an advantage, right? We, you, know, you should seize the initiative, try to play something that gives you a, a good chance to win. And I failed to do so in this game. And just to give you the rest of this game, it's really not a very interesting game, just because all the pieces were traded very quickly. OK, he went b6. Now my one target has moved into a dark square. And after, um, really, the, these moves were quite straightforward. We traded rooks. And OK, the rest of the game was quite simply a draw. And the reason I show you this game, like I said, is just the tournament standing, I think, got to me. I said, all right, I have six out of eight. If I lose, I drop into a tie for maybe fourth or fifth place. And that made me really nervous. It made me think that, do I, do I really want to go all, all out and try to win the game? Um, and like I said, in some cases, that really backfires. And in this game, I mean, the rest of the game was just a bunch of moves, and it was just an easy draw. Um, no issues whatsoever. But it's very disappointing. And I'm sure all of you have played in tournaments where you're trying to go for a win but you might not either exploit the weaknesses of your opponent's position, or you don't even get a chance to create weaknesses whatsoever. And that's what this game taught me. And it's funny because it's like the most boring game ever. I was really sitting there at the board. I really remember this very vividly. I'm looking at Hikaru's game. His game's all exciting. He crushes Josh Friedel. And I'm demoralized, saying, well, I need to win my game to tie with him. But I mean, I gave myself no opportunity. Um, so again, this game in particular was a huge disappointment for me. OK, second place in that US championship was a phenomenal. I could never have dreamed of such a result before the event and even after. I mean, it's still reflecting on that tournament. It was amazing. And going in, if you said you can finish your tournament tied for second, I mean, I would take that in a heartbeat no matter what happened. But at the given moment, I was incredibly um, shaken by my lack of um, kind of mental fortitude and lack of aggression. And I thought that you know, going forward in the future, I learned a very valuable lesson from this game. Um, and I will show you my, the next game I want to show, which is way more complicated and um, in a much uh, higher quality game than simply trading the pieces and making a draw. So if we uh, I'll pop back to the beginning, the starting position, and um, I was white in this game as well, the game I'm about to show. Um, sorry that that game wasn't so exciting. This, I promise this one is, is a lot better. Um, but the next game was White against Yuri Shulman. We were playing in the Chicago Open, uh, 2012, and it was round nine. I had um, I had six out of eight. I was tied. No, was a half point. I think I was half point behind uh, Gabriel Sargissian, who has helped Levon Aronian in many events. He's been a second for Levon. He's an Armenian grandmaster who's incredibly strong. Um, he had six and a half. He drew very quickly. So I knew with the white pieces playing Yuri. Yuri had five and a half. Um, out of eight. So once again, I somehow, and Perry against Yuri, dropped down to play him. 
and I knew I needed to beat him to tie for first. And there's a huge prize difference between uh, tying a two-way split with first place or tying a bunch of ways second through, I forget what it was, second through sixth or whatever it may be. And it was like you know a $5,000 difference. And I'm not a person who plays chess for money. Of course, you know, I, I, you know, as a professional player, you have to always be cognizant of the money at the end of the line. But uh, at this point in my life, I was uh, uh, in, uh, going to college. I mean, uh, it was, um, I, I wasn't so focused on the money at the end of the day. I was focused on playing good moves. And that's always kind of been my motto. And it's helped me a lot in many cases because I don't get nervous necessarily about the prize fund at the end. But you know, I'm not this infallible robotic figure. I, I do get a bit nervous sometimes. And this game in particular, I wasn't nervous at all. And I felt I remember feeling so fresh. So just, I have nothing really to lose. I'm trying to beat Yuri. Uh, he must be nervous because he might want to beat me and try to t uh, get more money for himself because he's a half point behind me. So he really needs to win to get into uh, the, the top of the leaderboard. So in that game, I opted for d4. And you know, I play both e4 and d4 myself. I chose so d4, I don't want to get into anything too risky. I want to get a stable advantage. Um, it's something I've talked a lot about in my commentary throughout the Sinkfield Cup. It's very important uh, sometimes to have maybe a slightly, slightly better position, nothing too major, but giving yourself all the chances because sometimes be the greatest way to play chess. Your opponent suffers, you start squeezing them, applying the pressure in the position, and they move back and forth, hoping that something good for them happens. But in reality, it's, it's a one-sided affair. It's called playing for two results. That is, in the position, you know that at any point you can bail yourself out for a, a draw, but you're still trying to build the momentum and, and gain uh, a positional advantage. And if we go through this game a little bit, I was white played uh, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6. So Yuri's trying to play the king's Indian. And if you guys have seen the games of Hikaru Nakamura, you'll know it can be an incredibly dangerous opening uh, for black. Black can get a really big initiative on the king side, create incredible um, attacking chances. And one game in particular that I recommend is Boris Gelfand against Hikaru Nakamura. So if you guys have time at some point to look at that game, I actually it was at the World Team Championships in Turkey. He played this amazing game where he sacrificed some pieces and he just crushed Boris and checkmate him. And Boris Gelfand, of course, is one of the world's most elite players. He played Anand in that um, World Championship match. It was one of the most amazing games I've seen in person. So again, that those kind of games show you how dangerous it can be. So I was thinking, Yuri doesn't really play the King's Indian very much. He's much more of a solid opening player. He generally ch um, can choose for the Grunfeld with d5. I've known him to play that. And Yuri's also the type of player who will opt for the uh, Nimzo structures. And the, the difference is that, um, you know, something like, let's say, knight c3, bishop b4. And OK, it's, a very, it's very early in the game, but it becomes a very positional battle, um, whereas the king's Indian generally is more tactical. And it, if you're down half a point in the last round with the black pieces against, um, you know, I was a grandmaster against a grandmaster, you know, you need to do something. You can't just play some slow positional thing where white is slightly better and squeezing you. You need to mix it up. And you know, you would love to play a sharp Sicilian that gives both sides incredible chances because you know a loss versus a draw for him might not make a difference and in, in, you might not get zero money with a draw so in which case you just got to win the game and that led Yuri in this game to opt for the king's indian and i went knight c3 and i was saying bishop g7 e4 d6 knight this is the classical line today in the um, maxime vachu le grave hikaru nakamura game we saw the move f3 was played um, this is the same ish it's also very popular it's a little bit more of a positional setup generally but I was in a in a good mood. I went knight f3. I was inviting him to. I was trying to have him show his card, see exactly what line he wanted to go into. And I actually caught him off guard, as we'll sh I'll show you in a, in a couple moves. He castled. I went bishop e2 and e5. The idea is that if you take on e5, well, I mean, you can play this and trade queens. But realistically, white's not actually playing for much of an advantage. The problem is after knight takes e5, eventually this e4 pawn uh, comes under attack. I mean, even a move like knight takes e4 now is possible. And we see that both knights on e4 and e5 are hanging. So this just results in a bunch of trades. And OK, it's not the end of the world um, for either side. But it's not really, at, it's, it's kind of running into problems like I, I had in the Kobian game. I'm starting to trade a bunch of pieces, not giving myself ample opportunity to play for legitimate winning chances. So this is, I mean, these, these op this opening has played so many times. And uh, move bishop e3 I played, very principal. And he went knight to g4.
So you can already see he's playing very active chess. And OK, you can't leave your bishop on e3. You don't really want to drop back to c1 because all right, now you've let him just push you backwards. And that's not really helpful for white. So I went uh, bishop g5, attacking his queen. I'm trying to provoke the move f6. If you guys know Ben Feingold, he says, never play f6. You know, he, he's joking you know, in general, but as a principle, it, it is quite a decent one. I mean, you're blunting your bishop on g7. You're opening the squares around your king. You don't really want to play a move like f6. So after bishop g5, OK, f6 was played. Bishop h4, Yuri goes knight c6. He's trying to counter in the center. You don't want to release the tension too soon. Um, because after takes, you can even take with a knight. Your knight on g4 is hanging. White has clearly gained nice central squares for himself. And black is not actually actively attacking the central squares. We, the pawn on e5 was doing a nice job. Now it looks like black is very cramped. The bishop on g7 looks quite silly. And white has actually very nice development and good prospects, especially with your knight on g4 on pre. If you move back to e5, yeah, I can even go f4 now. I'm just gaining space, trying to make good moves in the center. And it's clear that black is being forced backwards, whereas white is just uh, seizing a, a nice few tempi that can gain him the initiative. So instead, he went knight c6. He's keeping the tension alive in the center of the board. And I took on e5. Now, it seems a bit weird to make this move pawn takes e5. A lot of times, white opts for a move like d5 and trying to gain space in the center. And if a move like knight e7, eventually try to work for this pawn on c5. However, the bishop on h4 usually is on e3 in, in ideas where you're pushing for c5 so you can protect it. My bishop is admittedly a bit misplaced out here because there's no clear target for it. And yeah, white is doing quite nicely. You have um, a great strong center. You do have prospects to go b4 and expand on the queen side. That means it's a very viable option. And again, white is gaining space, but nothing concrete yet. So a very normal style of play that I could have gone for. But instead, I decided to shake things up uh, with d takes e5. So now, decision time. We can't take pawn takes e5, f takes, because we lose our queen. Right? That, of course, would not be a good option. We can take with this knight on e5. But once again, you're losing control over the central squares. White clearly has a nice queen on d1. Your bishop on g7 is going to be out of play for quite a while. White can just castle and continue a normal, natural plan where black is a bit cramped. And it's not really fun to be on that side of the board when you know, your pawns are all stuck back here. Uh, the, your third rank is the farthest your pawn has gone. I've already had two pawns in the center. d5 is completely mine. Um, it just is much more comfortable to play as white. And taking with the other knight makes even less sense because your knight on g4 is totally misplaced. And I might just retreat my knight. Why should I start trading? And now your knights are in big trouble because I'm threatening to go f4 at some point and kick this knight. I can go h3 and kick that knight. Your, your knights are just very misplaced over on the king's side. So it allows white very easy pawn play, um, which you know, I'm just expanding while attacking your pieces with my pawns. So that left Yuri to the decision d takes e5. And here, OK, I can trade queens if I really want to. But I'm, I'm in a bit of a fighting move. And I want to uh, kind of muddy the waters a little bit. And I go queen d5 check. So what is the idea behind queen d5? For one, I mean, there's, there's obviously I'm putting the king in check. But I'm also inviting black to take the queen on d5. After queen takes d5, well, now I have a bunch of options. Well, I can take with the e-pawn, the c-pawn, the knight. Um, and the knight take on d5 allows, all right, I'm looking like I'm attacking this pawn. Rook f7 is more or less forced to protect it. And white has a nice spatial advantage. It's clear that the d5 square is his. Um, black has to take time to unravel. But at the end of the day, excuse me, black is still quite concrete. Um, very solid position. You can eventually go knight to d8, push my knight away with c6, and then move maybe your knight to e6. So you can unravel yourself as well. So after queen takes d5, I think I would have taken with the pawn on d5. And the idea is now I've, I've changed the pawn structure a bit. I've opened, importantly, opened the c file for my rook. And I'm attacking your knight, forcing you um, to make a decision on where to move it. And eventually, my knight is going to come to, might want to come to b5. For example, knight to e7, well, knight b5 is tempting immediately. 
because now it's very difficult to protect your c7 pawn. Knight e7 looks like a normal retreat, but in reality, you're getting yourself in big trouble because I'm attacking your rook, rook to b8, and pawn to d6, and your knight is trapped. So black has to be very, I mean, it's very weird that already the knight is trapped, but you know, somehow, and my knight's not doing so hot either, but you gotta figure out your, your situation first, and white is doing fantastically winning that knight. So you can't really retreat back to e7 because you're gonna get in trouble with the c7 pawn, and knight to b4 looks a little too adventurous for my taste. After a simple move like rook to c1, for example, uh, well actually rook c1 might not even be the best move, but you're, you're having a one move threat, knight to c2, so I can even just castle and say, all right, I mean, you're, you're not threatening anything anymore, and I'm just gonna put my rooks in the center. For example, after castles, you know, it's hard to even necessarily suggest um, the easiest moves for black, a3, and all right, I'm just pushing you backwards. I'm saying, what, do you, what exactly are you attempting to do? And I can even just go rook to c1, maybe rook to d1, and white is just gaining space, has a nice position, and black's pieces are a little misplaced, especially the knight on g4. The bishop on c8 doesn't have a clear home, and the bishop on g7, well, that looks like a big pawn just sitting behind the f6, e5 chain. So, Yuri decides, in the, instead of um, transforming the pawn structure and letting me take c takes d5, which is, again, a pawn capture towards the center, he decided that he's just going to move his king over to h8. And he said, you know, you move your queen up the board, so what? What are you, exactly are you doing? Well, I, I, you know, I was thinking for a bit here. I, I remember sitting a, a little while and thinking, all right, so the knight on g4 is misplaced. Like I mentioned, the bishop on g7 kind of stinks. Um, but my bishop on h4, you know, it's not the best piece. Where do, you know, I can castle queen side, castle king side. I have a lot more space, but how do I take advantage of it? All these thoughts are running through my head. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if you think back to your game against Kobe and you got nothing and you had no chance to win. So at least you have ideas. Even if they're not good ideas, and I have plenty of terrible ideas that come to my head uh, during every chess game, well, at least I have ideas, period. It's not just, um, the position isn't just whittled down to no material. So I go rook d1, all right, I didn't want to castle queen side, I thought maybe I'll castle king side at some point. Maybe if we get to an end game, my king might be better suited in the center of the board. And Yuri avoided the queen trade and went queen to e7, which was a very smart decision because, again, the queen trade now might be even worse because black had a useless move of king h8 for a very useful move for white on rook d1. So this queen trade uh, really is not so smart for black. Also, it might, um, yeah, just the, with the rook on d1, it's just a very nice protected square on d4. My pawn on d5 is looking beautiful. So you can't do that. You do a queen e7. And I went queen to d2. It's funny, right? My queen is looking fine on d5. Um, why would you retreat to d2? So I guess I'm going to ask you guys just to, to get you involved a little bit. Why do you think queen d2 is a, a decent response? By the way, that's not a retreat. You advance to the rear. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's a, that's a good way of uh, phrasing it. It's a very kind way of phrasing it. It's not a retreat, advance to the rear. But what is it about the move queen d2? Um, what are the benefits of that move? I'm not saying it's an amazing move. I'm not um, you know, trying to say I made some you know, just ridiculously strong move or anything of that sort. But what can you guys think of the positives of a move like queen to d2? If there are any. Well, for one thing, it, 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 the queen can't be harassed there by the knight, by the black knight. It, you know, right. No, that, that, that's important. So the point is, one point that's just made is the queen can't be harassed on the d5 square. For one, the knight maybe can move, the bishop can come to d5, rook to d8 can be annoying to deal with. So all these moves, and that would make my queen have to go over to like b5. My queen really doesn't want to be over there. So one idea is definitely to avoid being harassed, and another very important point is that the d5 square is better suited for my knight. Because the queen on e7 is now there, my knight on d5 will attack the queen on e7, put pressure on the c7 square if you, know, you have trouble defending it. So it's a retreat that has a clear purpose. It's just that square is better suited for a knight than the queen. So I went um, knight, queen d2. He went queen f7, avoiding this immediate knight d5 move. And um, now knight to d5. So there are actually tactics in the air. It doesn't really look like a tactical position yet, but I'm going to make a completely arbitrary and random move like a6. And that actually gets in a lot of trouble after the simple move h3. Knight to h6. And well, thank you for the pawn. Because if you take 
my knight with the bishop, well now your knight on h6 is under attack and I, I, I've won a pawn. So there actually are some tactics at play here that black has to be quite careful about. Because you can't just, I mean, okay, a6 is not a good move by any stretch of the imagination, but it just goes to show that if you're not careful, one small miscalculation can lead to a very strong um, pawn, uh, well, a pawn, I would say pawn win, it sounds weird, but the win of a pawn for white. So it said he went g5, which is a pretty drastic measure. Again, the I have to remind you the tournament situation. If I win, I tie for first place. If Yuri draws, he gets zero dollars. If Yuri wins, he gets you know he gets a, a good deal tying for second place. So G5 is a very um, you know it's an adventurous <laughs> attempt. It's I have to move my bishop back to G3, and now Knight H6 is on a safe square. But at the same time, there are clear positional weaknesses. Um, made by this move. The f5 square is now vulnerable if my knight can retreat to e3 at the proper moment. Um, and you're just really pushing your pawns on the king's side. Once you move a pawn, it obviously can't move back. Uh, the pawn on f6 is now clearly a backwards pawn. And again, this bishop on g7 is not exactly the prettiest piece on the board. So bishop to g3 and knight h6. Now knight h6 is very important because if you don't go knight h6, I'm immediately going h4. Let's waste another move again with a6 because that's a fun way to waste it. h4 now I'm breaking open the king side. Your pawn on g5 is very vulnerable and your king is on line with my rook. So it's not exactly the wisest decision to uh, allow me to just break on h4 for nothing. So knight h6, I castle. So I had a decision to make here. I can go h4, but I thought after g4, well it's very difficult to now go after this pawn. I'm making my own king side quite weak, so if I castle, now I have to be worried about his queen coming to h5 and my pawn on h4. And also, this knight is not exactly uh, finding a great home. Knight h2, I'm not attacking anything, and now this knight on d4. And we see, actually, black has far more control over the d4 square than white over d5. Black is going to go c6, kick the knight from d4, uh, excuse me, from d5, and well, I don't have, a, my pawn can't move backwards, I wish, uh, but you know, my pawn can't move backwards to kick the knight. So black would be very happy with this transposition here. So instead, castles, bishop e6, and I'm just enjoying the spatial advantage I have. And I just go h3. Now, the idea is maybe my knight will come to h2 and try to put a knight on g4 and gain some space on the king side. You don't really want to go g4 yourself because the, I'm trading my h-pawn for your g-pawn. In all the resulting endings, you have a weak uh, isolated h-pawn. And um, very importantly, I'm, like I said, knight h2 retreat allows me to get to the g4 square. So it's just kind of a, a bit of a waiting move to see exactly what's up black sleeve. And you want rook d8, okay, very natural playing on the open d file. I went queen to e3, stepping out of the pin, um, also allowing my queen to maneuver quite a bit, maybe to b3, maybe to a3. Uh, pawn to b4 is a nice launching attempt to gain space, more space on the queen side. And if we just take a second to look at the position on the board, black is quite cramped. The farthest any of his pieces are, are on uh, his own third rank, the sixth rank. And white, on the other hand, is making great use of the knight on d5. So it's hard to even suggest um, a move right now for black. I mean, it's not that black's position is anything. We're close to loss. Black is worse, and quite a bit worse, to be honest. But it's not like you're losing. Um, but most importantly, chess is a game of plans. And we're not talking about individual moves here. We're saying, well, what do we see black accomplishing in the next five moves? What about the next 10 moves? It's easy for me to sit here and say, well, if I'm white, I'm going to go b4. I'm going to go uh, b5, maybe, and try to get a7. I can go rook d2 and rook, other rook to d1. I can go knight h2, knight to g4, and try to trade away the knights and capture towards the center with the pawn. All of these ideas are crossing through my mind, whereas I'm saying, all right, what's black up to? And that, that's an essential question, is what, you know, what can you do as black? And it's not so easy to see that. And so it's a very uncomfortable position to be in as black. And is exactly what I was going for uh, in this game. I was thinking, you know, it's one, one of those situations I was telling you about with, where I'm playing for two results. I know that I'm slightly better, maybe even more than a, slightly better, quite a bit better. But black is really um, stuck backwards. And in order to break out, you have to figure out a concrete plan. So you already started with rook d7. OK, we're trying to double in the d file. But again, my knight on d5 is a hard knight to kick. You're going to have to remove your knight from c6 and then go c6 yourself. But in that meantime, you're pawn on a7. So the queen on e3 is spying 
on that pawn on a7, as well as getting out of the pin on the d file. So I have queen to b3. Now, of course, the pawn on b7 is a, a clear, clearly under attack. But more importantly, I'm just trying to provoke additional weaknesses. If a move like b6, let's say, he did not play this move, but a move like b6, well, the light squares on the queen side are now a bit vulnerable. I can gain space with a move like queen to a4. So my queen transferred from d2 to a4, which is a useful transfer, because now this knight is under attack on c6. The a7 pawn might become a target. And white can just start pushing on the queen side b4, uh, maybe c5, and gaining even more space. So this is kind of my idea behind the move queen d3. And Yuri decided that, OK, he didn't really want to make any weaknesses. He didn't want to make any concessions, and went knight to d8. And OK, there's two ideas. One is protecting the pawn on b7. The other is to go c6 and kick my knight. And a third plan is to go c5 himself and really just clamp down on this d4 square and try to jump his knight back in towards the center. So I went knight back to e3. I didn't want to give him c6 with a tempo. And I, didn't, um, I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted my pieces. So knight e3, yeah, it's a, bit, a move of a bit of uncertainty, but it also has clear benefits as well. It also opens the d file up. By going knight to d8, now he can't double his rooks on the d file. So I thought it might be a good time to challenge the d file. Other options that uh, immediately came to my mind are like a move like queen to a3. The idea, again, being attacking the pawn, maybe going b4 next move, gaining some additional space. So these are um, the kinds of things that I think about when I'm playing is, well, how can I provoke a weakness? What are my plans? And you know, this game, again, was from a couple years ago, but I still definitely think that way. And it's a very beneficial way of thinking. Because you know, I'll say time and time again, chess isn't a game of moves, it's a game of ideas. And black is kind of lost in, in the current position, not lost on the board. I mean lost in terms of ideas. It's very difficult to come up with concrete strategies. Whereas for white, you've got the nice positional advantage. You've got weak, uh, weak pawns on the black, uh, weak squares on the black, uh, black king side. F5 is particularly weak. And that's why I made the move knight e3. Queen a3 is also a very, very good move. But I just thought, now I'm going to just try to take the d file because you can't double your rooks. And here, Yuri opted for the move rook to e8, because I guess, what else? Um, you, he doesn't want to do anything too drastic. A move like f5 is never possible, because g5 and e5 are uh, always going to be vulnerable. In fact, you just lose the pawn on g5. A move like g4 is not one you really want to play, um, because again, you're trading this h3 pawn for your g5 pawn. You get an isolated h pawn. And, more importantly, again, now that the d file is up for grabs, white is very quick to just capture on d7 and put the next rook on d1. And as we see, that's the only open file. And of course, rooks love open files. So in rook e8, and I think his idea is essentially to pseudo double on the d file, like a rook e7, trade rooks, and then bring the next rook to d7. Um, that way he can compete for the file. So I said, OK, knight to h2. Now I'm, I'm trying to put something on g4, and I'm preventing black from ever doing so himself. And I'm just, you know, if I can start trading, what I would like to do at some point is probably trade these bishops. So let's make a random move, king g8. And if you will allow me to do so, and let's say this ha happened, let's look at this bishop on g7. Pretty ugly. More importantly, this square on f5, pretty awesome. So white has really gained a lot from the trades that uh, have occurred because a lot of positional weaknesses for black. And again, look at this. I mean, this bishop is bad. And this backwards f6 pawn is not doing so hot. And white's plan is easy. I go solidify my pawn chains with f3, bring my bishop back to f2, and just throw my knight into f5. And eventually, if I can get some pieces of the h file, well, that's just an added bonus. But that's really um, not in the cards. It's a little bit of a, it's wishful thinking. So king g8 was a wasted move. I'm just trying to show you the ideas of the position. Rook to d4. So what Yuri would like uh, more than anything else is for me to take on d4 and allow him to open up the e file, perhaps, allow him to go c5 and get a nice pawn chain. I mean, c5, b6, all the way through is nice. It's very hard to break down that pawn chain. And not to mention that now he's maybe trying to go f5 himself. So let's say I go knight to d5. Well, that's a, a possibility because the pawn on c7 is hit. Um, maybe he can just go even go c6, allowing me to get the bishops because, well, his knight comes out to play. And all right, black's position is absolutely awesome, but at the same time, knight c5 is an immediate threat, hitting the pawn e4. At some point, f5 might be in the cards for black to just open up that silly bishop on g7. So he's just looking for something dynamic. 
and I wasn't going to give that to him. I, I mean, I thought about it. I thought maybe that actually helps me, but I was just trying to make this game as one-sided as possible. So I chose f3. And on one hand, it looks like it locks this bishop into e2, but the bishop isn't really the most important piece at the moment. An idea is to go knight g4 and just protect that square as much as possible, but also very importantly is to drop this bishop home to f2. And once the bishop is there, OK, I'm going to try to kick the rook on d4. So Yuri played a smart move, c5. And now there's, I went knight to d5. You know, I'm just trying to, that square now he can't compete with because he can never go c6. And I said, well, my knight might as well go back there. And my bishop is coming to f2. Uh, maybe I can go queen a3 at the right moment to uh, kind of chisel away at his queenside pawns. And he made the move simply knight c6. And here was actually a very interesting moment. If we just pause for a second, we see that, again, the d5 square is white. The d4 square is black. But awkwardly, there's a rook on d4 rather than a knight. And here was a very critical moment. And I can actually attempt to win an exchange. So I, I made the move queen e3. But let's look at the move rook d to e1. Very counterintuitive. We had a rook on the open file. But I moved my rook away from the open file. But the real reason is because your rook is quite silly on, on this d4 square. My next move is bishop f2. Your rook isn't exactly finding a home. And the computer really likes this move, rook d1. I saw it, but I canceled the idea in my head because what I didn't like was, let's say, b6. I'm just throwing in a move to protect my pawn chain, bishop f2. And I'm just going to throw in another random move. You know, it's not so random, but it's important to look at it. And I just didn't really see, after the knight on d4, in such a closed position, I wasn't sure the rook is actually more valuable than the knight, uh, excuse me, than the bishop on f2. And the point is, now I can never remove that knight from d4. Um, and am I, it's hard for white to establish anything concrete. OK, maybe I can try on the queen side to make a b4 break. But I also was concerned maybe black can now go f5 and expand a bit on the king side. Whereas you know, we tell you time and time again a rook is more valuable than a minor piece. But not always. Some position, I'm, I personally love sacrificing the exchange. Um, that's you know, one of my trademarks, I'd say, is if I, can, if I can and it's good and it makes some kind of imbalance that doesn't you know, kill me, I love doing it. It's one of my favorite things in chess. And so to give that up to Yuri was not really something I was looking to do because you know, I was saying, oh, let's switch colors. Let me get that exchange sack in. Uh, but really, more importantly, is just that knight on d4 is so nice here. The knight, you know, that's what the power of the knights. They can jump in and jump out whenever they so choose. And my rooks can't really maneuver that well for the time being. So I decided that I wasn't going to get uh, greedy. And instead, I went queen to e3. And I was trying to maybe go a3, pawn to b4. Um, just kind of slow maneuvering was the theme of the game here. And um, yeah, he went rook takes d1. So he just said, all right, I don't really have a more useful move at the moment. He's like, oh, Robert's probably trying to go a3, b4, like I said, open up on the queen side, which is a very good idea. So he took on d1. I went bishop takes. So again, it looks funky to take with the bishop on d1, but what is this rook doing on the d file? The knight d4 closes the rook down. There's no future for it on the d file. You know, he, could take, he, he wouldn't take this bishop, because why would you? The knight on d4 completely dominates the bishop in this position. Uh, and most importantly, the bishop on d1 now can go over to a4. That's, that's one of my ideas, is that the bishop on this square doing nothing. The bishop on a4, at least it's uh, pretending to do something if it's not actually doing something. Um, and I was just really happy to just not leave any of my piece under attack. And my rook, it, it remains to be seen where this rook belongs. So even knight to d4. Bishop to e1, so I'm playing uh, a little bit backwards, but I'm trying to get my pieces on the perfect squares. He went knight to g8. OK, he's doing the same thing. Well, that knight on h6 is really not doing much. Let's get it back into the game. h4, so OK, all right, let me try to see what I can do to break open the position. On one hand, I might think about going g3 to f4, but again, if g3 here, then now it just, that just hangs a pawn, not something I'm looking to do. So h4, gaining space. He went queen g6. There also could be problems if you go h6. Opening the h file might not actually suit black's fancy, because in a lot of lines, um, let's say takes, takes, knight g4, I would love to get my queen or rook. I mean, king f2 is actually a move that's possible coming up. And get my rook to the h file. And the king is not so safe. Um, if you trade, it looks like you're ruining my pawn structure. But really, you have a big weakness on f6. 
and queen h3 check is immediately a threat. And knight e7 doesn't really help because there are moves like queen takes g5. And the pawn on f6 is pinned to the queen on f7. And this trans, uh, transformation in structure is really terrible for black. The rook on the seventh rank just dominates, and I'm up a pawn to boot. So he I went h4. He went queen to g6, takes, takes. And now we've seen the pawn structure has changed a lot. Now the pawn on e5 is isolated, which is going to be very important for the rest of the game. And now I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I thought that may, I want my knight on h2 to come into the game, much like Maxime Bashir Legrave wanted his knight on h1 to come into the game today against Nakamura. But I thought, you know, I can just leave it there for the time being. And I went bishop d2. OK, I'm hitting a pawn, h6. And now I made the move g4. So all right, we tend to not want to open our king much, but my king's almost impossible to attack. It's actually very safe. My real idea is rook f2. Knight f1, knight g3, knight f5. Or rook f2, knight f1, rook h2. One of those ideas, again, I'm gaining more space. I'm controlling more squares. I'm quite happy. Another idea, principle idea is queen a3. And I'm actually winning a pawn, because you can't protect both um, c5 and a7. But I was a bit concerned about a move like b5. And it doesn't look like a very uh, concerning move. But if he can start making my pawns move, well, then he can maybe think about taking and going, let's say, e4, for example. He's opening up the position. And my queen's on the, the other side of the board. Maybe it's not the safest position for um, white to enter. So I, I could have done that. And it's, it's a bit of a greedy move. I could have also gone knight c7, trying to hit pieces. But I don't want this bishop. The bishop is not a good piece at all. And so I just said opted for g4. And he went knight e7. OK, he wants to do something with a knight. And I went rook f2. So I was very, very happy with the way I'd been playing. I thought I was gaining a, a nice initiative going. And I'm on queen a3 now. And he went knight c6. So he was hoping that I would be quite silly and get my queen in some pretty big trouble after bishop f8, the queen is trapped. So I saw that, um, that I couldn't do that. I just wanted to vacate the e3 square in case my, this knight on f1 wanted to come to e3. or this knight on d5 wanted to drop back to e3. And the idea is that if I can get this knight to g3 and this knight to e3, maybe I'm throwing some stuff into f5. So I'm just trying to create as many problems as possible for him. Nothing is super concrete yet, but playing on both sides of the board is particularly helpful in a position like this when white has all the ideas and black is just trying to parry all the threats. So knight g3, is, I mean, again, it's coming through f5, rook f8. But like, look at the moves that black is playing. Black is going rook f8. What next? Rook maybe go to d8, back to f8. There's no, as kind of I mentioned um, prefacing this game, sometimes it's so nice to be on the side where you're making useful looking moves and your opponent has nothing useful to do. And that's what I did this game. I didn't take his rook. I didn't um, try to get greedy on pawns. I thought, well, I'm just going to go for it and try to um, just try to slowly outmaneuver him, make, make him try to do something drastic, take some sort of drastic measure, which would likely backfire. So you're in rook f8. I went knight f5. OK, if he takes, I have a nice pawn on f5. And I'm going to take with the g pawn. And then he did take. You know, he Really, what else can he do? Um, it's kind of tragic that for black here that there aren't many options. Your bishop on g7 really stinks. Um, your bishop on e6, not really doing that much either. Um, but the question remains, what strategy can you uh, suggest for black? And as we're sitting at the board, you know, I could see Yuri's face, of course. He was not very happy with the position. Because even if the computer says it's just you know, better for white, but nothing too significant, we're humans. It's really, really uncomfortable to be boxed in. So he took. I took, and he took on d5. So really, some, some big measures have been taken here, because now I took on d5. And so what we, the resulting position has happened, my g4 and c4 pawns are now in f5 and d5. So they're farther up the board. Um, he does have a knight that, and, I, and as well, I don't, obviously. But his knight on d4, OK, it looks beautiful there, but what's it doing? The knight on d4, where he played it, I mean, I have no weaknesses. That's really important to note. Um, it's not that black has a tremendous amount of weaknesses either. It's just the light squares now are totally white. White has a light square bishop, black doesn't. So I started with rook h2. OK, I'm threatening bishop takes g5. He, of course, is not going to allow me to do that. And went queen to e7. And now I went queen a6. So again, I'm just trying to take up uh, more of the position for myself. I'm maybe a4, a5 to chisel away at the black 
king side, uh, excuse me, queen side pawns is definitely a possibility. And again, what does black do? Um, it's really hard to suggest a, a plan. You can shuffle around, which is what Yuri sort of did, waiting for it to, he was kind of waiting to see what I had in store. If I don't have anything really concrete, well, then I'm just shuffling my pieces around. I'm looking good. You know, I'm, I'm looking good, but I'm not doing anything. So it's kind of just like aesthetically pleasing without any result uh, coming to be. So you know, King G8, I want A4. Again, I, I'm really have clear plans. I can go B4 at some point if I want. I can go A5. I can just decide, do I want to bring my king all the way over to the queen side? I mean, he can't really stop me from bringing my king like down this way. I can go through, move my bishop, go king to a, b1 or something if I don't want my king on this side of the board. So that was actually funny because one of my ideas was, since black can do nothing but shuffle, I want to decide where the optimal squares are for all my pieces. And it's something very important in chess, not just this game, is deciding um, when to make a break. And actually, Fabiano Caruana's game today was a particular note in that fashion um, he went this move c5 really early and allowed Vichy to liquidate and end up in a drawn position, whereas he could have spent a zillion moves pressing Vichy, making him uncomfortable with you know, no space. And so that's kind of the mindset you need to take is that if you have time, use it. You have to be patient. Chess is a game where you have to rush, where you want to just, um, you do want to throttle your opponent. You always do. Everyone wants to beat their opponent, but sometimes that actually backfires, that kind of mindset of, I just need to crush you, let me do it immediately. Sometimes the slow, methodical way is much better than the uh, super aggressive way. So queen c7, I went queen c4. So again, I was tempted by a5, but I was just trying to get all my pieces on the best squares. Now, okay, I'm threatening to try to go d6 with check and maybe get a, use that pass pawn. You know, queen d6, he's not going to allow me. Bishop e3, again, now I was thinking, do I really want to move my king, slither away to the queen side? Um, it's actually a very difficult question to answer. I'm not sure which side of the board the king is better suited on. Neither side, black can really launch an attack. Um, but let's say, for argument's sake, we just took both these queens off the board. My king would kind of want to be on c4. Um, because it's very safe there, it's very active, and in endgame where the queens are off the board, maybe my, you know, my king will, can do a lot over on the queen side. So rook d8, I want rook g2. Again, it's just making some moves, queen f1. So I'm actually, in some vague sense, going, hoping to try to open things on the king side, but realistically, I'm just trying to maneuver my pieces around. It, it looks funny that I went rook g2, queen f1. I wasn't really throwing anything of note. Queen e7, bishop c2. So I'm actually inviting him to take my bishop. I really want him to take my bishop because the knight on d4 is the only active piece. And it's funny because we like our two bishops' advantage. Not always our two bishops' advantage, but we say two bishops' advantage. Um, but here, this doesn't actually help black at all because now I have all the active play. Now I can try to break at some moment with time to break on the queen side with a5 at the right moment. And black, again, is very stumped. There's, there's nothing um, black can do to unravel his pieces. So he just decided, all right, he's going to keep his annoying knight on d4, you know, queen e8. I want bishop back to d1. We made, you know, we're just moving around a bit. These moves aren't partic of a particular importance, but they show um, how it's necessary to, to some find the right squares. You might not find it immediately. I mean, I look, if we just go back a few moves, I kind of went around a little bit. I beat around the bush, I move my queen around, d3 to c4. So the specific moves aren't that important. It's finally coming up with the right plan. So he decided to go a5. Now that's actually quite, um, um, you know, it, it's a move that gives up a lot because now, in particularly endgame, I would love to trade queens and put my king on c4. Because now the, he can never stump me on b5 with a move like a6. So it's a huge concession. The b6 pawn is forever, um, I guess, a weakness, but it's hard to get to because the rook on d6 is protecting it very well. So here I thought, OK, he went a5. What's his, what's his agenda? Well, I think he's just trying to close down the position, and he wants to stop me from getting b4 in because b4 would be a nice way to try to break open the position. And so with that in mind, he said, all right, I don't want to allow b4. I don't want to allow a5 at a certain moment. So I'm going to go a5 myself. But it, there are some drawbacks, namely that the pawn on b6 is backwards and forever target. And now you really will never have any semblance of uh, counterplay. So rook h2, king f8. So again, Yuri's also trying to bring his king over here. Why would I leave my king on the king's side? My pawn on h6 is very well defended. 
my king's got to run. So king f2, I'm just saying, all right, let's do this. Bishop e2, he went king back to f8. So he decided that perhaps it's not the right time to maneuver his king over to d8, because also, if king d8, now maybe I'll infiltrate with queen a6. And his king is actually not doing so hot when my queen comes into play on, uh, over here. And his bishop, again, his bishop is really silly. And actually, at some point, I might consider taking his knight. So that's something we keep talking about opposite colored bishops. There are a lot of opposite colored bishop draws today. But if you give me the chance, and especially with your king so vulnerable, I might take on d4 and bring my bishop into c6. And I'll, I'll just make some uh, random moves just for argument's sake. Bishop b5. And after, you know, the, oops, sorry, the queen has to move somewhere, queen d8. Well, now it's super clear that black is never, ever going to be active. And white's idea is just to bring the rook over the open c file, maybe try to attack this pawn, maybe if I can get my rook to b3. I mean, black's just so cramped in there with no active, no, no chance of active play. So he decided to go back to f8. I want bishop f1. I'm just trying to figure out the right square. Maybe my bishop wants to slither around to h5 and come to g6. That, that, you know, all these different ideas are coming to mind. Again, I really need a win. I see that if I w only wait a tie first is with a win. So I'm going for it. Bishop d3. I'm just moving my pieces back and forth. And actually, this was a clever plan. I just wanted to go bishop a2. Now his rook can never move. Because as soon as his rook moves, I go d6, which is very tragic for him once I open up the queen and bishop. So he's just moving around, king f8, and queen a6. Finally, I got my queen over to a6, and an idea now is bishop to c4, maybe at the right moment take on d4. So queen to c8, he's offering the trade of queens. So it poses the question, do I have more winning chances with the queens on or off the board? And it's really a moment where you have to sit and think for a while, because on one hand, like I talked about before, maybe my king can come in with the queen trade. On the other hand, it's actually quite difficult because my f pawn is always weak. At some point, maybe he can try to use his advantage, pawn advantage on the king's side. And realistically, targets are hard to find once the queens are off the board and, and really hard to attack. This b6 pawn is very well protected. If we just look, his king will come to c7. And just optically, it looks very, very difficult to, to make some sort of concrete threats in the black, very solid pawn structure. So I didn't take. I wanted to, but I didn't. I went queen a7, queen c7. We made a few moves. And now I took. So I was like, you know what? I don't see a way to win. If he's just going to follow my queen around, you know, I, I don't want to retreat anymore because he can just keep repeating his position and I have nothing. So oh, I mean, I was, said, OK, I'll just do it. Um, I took on a8, and I went bishop c4. So we don't have many pieces on the board. Uh, well, I mean, we have two miners and a rook each. Um, and here I was just like, can I win this? I mean, this is hard. Can I win? Well, for one, if you blunder, you know, I'd be very happy about it. Now you immediately are losing because you let me pin your bishop. So I win a pawn that way. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but what else? I mean, is white really going to try to go bishop takes d4? That's a really hard question to answer. Opposite color bishops tend to have very drawish tendencies. So he started with king d8. So he's not blundering this uh, bishop takes g5 maneuver. So I went king g3. I said, well, OK, my king can go over to h5. Um, and maybe there's an eventual entrance via g6. So I went king to g4. And he went bishop to f8. And OK, he, he doesn't really have that many options. So he's just kind of maneuvering his pieces around. So he went bishop f8. And now I actually captured on d4. It was a really difficult choice. Um, admittedly, it's not easy to accept opposite colored bishops in an ending. But I said, OK, if I, when I take, he absolutely positively cannot take on there because e5. And OK, now you're giving me three pass pawns. You're, you're quite busted. So you're forced to take c takes. And I thought, OK, now I have the c file, the only open file on the board. So what I did was I maneuvered all my pieces to squares they wanted to go to. It didn't really look like I was doing that. And I, you know, in some sense, I was. I'm not trying to trick you guys. I'm just trying to say it doesn't really look like I'm going bishop takes d4 ever because the resulting position um, doesn't seem so easy to win. But as soon as he moved his bishop on g7 backwards and he, he, he can't take with the e pawn, I was like, all right, I have the only open file. That's mine for the taking. So now the question is, is it enough? Well, he can't compete for the open file. That's huge. So he went king, rook f6, 
and I went bishop to a6. I'm like, all right, well, I, my rook can infiltrate. Maybe rook c7, maybe rook c8. Your pass pawns are all stopped by my king and my, by my bishop, whereas my pass pawn, okay, it's not in danger of moving very quickly, but okay, I have all the, the play in the position. You have nothing, absolutely nothing. So king d7, bishop b5 check, king d8, and now I made a pretty um, difficult move to make, I think, and I went rook c6. So I was just talking about how I needed my rook to infiltrate. Now all of a sudden I decide, well, no, I don't really need it to infiltrate. Let's trade it. Really difficult move to make. And we both were in huge time trouble by this point. So I was just like, we're both scrambling. I mean, we probably both had less than uh, five minutes left. So nothing like Caruana Carlson, but still not enough time to really figure out all the difficulties and the positions. And there's lots of nuances, et cetera. But my idea is that maybe two pass pawns in an opposite color bishop ending are enough. And, well, he took. Well, what else can he do? If he goes king to e7, um, for example, well, I mean, I can maybe go rook c7 check, and now I'm really taking over the board. But also, you know, eventually he might have to take anyway. Um, and also, rook, excuse me, rook to c8 is very powerful as well. I mean, he just doesn't have many moves in the position, which is very frustrating. So he took. I took, and he went king c7. So he actually thought that this position should just be a dead draw. I was not so convinced. King h5, so now my king's running inwards. Um, it's funny that I was just, at first, just using it to s stop his pawns, but now my king can come to g6, my f pawn is passed. I thought I was quite happy. So he makes the only move d3, because, okay, I need to stop his pawn in its tracks at some point. Um, and it's funny, if we're gonna put on an engine, and I actually hate using engines in my analysis, because I like to figure out the ideas by myself, but just for the sake of this discussion, let's, let's look what the computer says. So the computer says plus one, if we see that. Now that in an end game, that's not necessarily the end of the world. There's lots of draws that happen. If you're a rook and pawn versus rook, that computer might say plus one, and it's not winning. But I actually thought I had excellent winning chances, and I'm not sure the computer understands um, kind of the difficulty of the position. See, the, it's climbing a bit. It's up to 1.36 uh, now. But it's a very, very difficult position for black to hold. And he went d3. And again, remember that we're in time trouble. So we're on move 72. We don't have a lot of time left. I'm taking king c6. And now if you look, the number's gone up and it says plus minus, white should be winning. So I went king g6, king c5, f, I went king f7. So I actually did this interesting thing where I brought my king to the other side. And it looks funky, but it's, for the moment it stops black from moving his king into my territory via d4. My bishop very easily stops his pawns, and he can no longer go bishop back to f8 because the e5 pawn is on pre. So he went h5, and here, this is why I brought the engine on for you guys. To look at the difference between bishop e2 and bishop f1. It says bishop e2 is winning, bishop f1 is better for white still, but maybe not enough. And I made the move f6, so I didn't even make one of the top two moves. And immediately, the, the computer is like, OK, now it's a lot harder to win. So bishop e2, um, this is a, it's, uh, it's actually not winning. The computer, again, loves the position. But it, the more it thinks, it, the more it says that a black can eventually sacrifice the bishop and hold the draw. I, I can uh, show that in a bit. But the point is that I made this move f6, which I thought was great, g4, and I went take on g4. So I, um, yeah, I just really <coughs> kind of lost all hope of a win because I thought I was still doing really well, but he just went g3, bishop h3, and now he brought his king backwards. It's kind of, I didn't really think about, oh, now he can move his king backwards and just keep the position at bay. And the problem is uh, once I go for a queen, like with king, like so, with king g7. Well, now I might even be getting myself in a little bit of dangerous territory. His king is coming after my bishop. He's, his pass pawn is also very fast. And actually, the line is a draw. But um, yeah, I just try to play, hoping that maybe he'd let me win. But OK, at this point, actually, it's just a draw, and we agreed for a draw here. So it just goes to show that. As hard as, as my hard work was for naught. I mean, I was so upset after the game because I knew I had done it. I knew I had gotten the position I wanted. And you know, as we wrap up here, I just want to. Uh, bishop e2 was just more precise, and actually f6. I think I can still go bishop e2 here. But the point of bishop e2, now if I had more time, I definitely would have done it. Is that you stop this g4 break in its tracks? Um, the bishop covers that vital square, and it, it prevents. White, uh, excuse me, black from creating that pass pawn with ease. And h4 is way too committal and, in fact, terrible, because now my bishop covers um, 
the square, you can't create a passed pawn. And so the opposite colored bishops equal amount of material, yet white is the one on top. And yeah, I, I um, was really, really upset after this game. Like I said, I would have tied for first if I'd won. And I knew I'd played like a really good game. And, and that's not boasting. I'm not trying to say, you know, I'm the man. Uh, it's more that. It's more that it's really devastating, especially like if you make a draw when it's like I, the game against Kobian, in that same situation, last round, you need to win the tie for first. You make a draw without giving yourself a chance, okay, that's upsetting, but it's not devastating. This game, I just missed, at this moment in time trouble, I missed my chance. But way more importantly than the result of this game itself, I'm going to remove the engine because I just don't like using engines when analyzing. The more important results of the game is I gave myself all the chances in the world. And I had no one to blame but myself at the end of the game for not winning. But what I just wanted to show is, you know, as the lecture was how to play for a win the last round, I made it so difficult for my opponent to get any sort of counterplay. Now, I wish all my games could be like this. I mean, unfortunately, they aren't. Uh, but the point was that he was half a point behind me. He needs to win with the black pieces. Never really easy to do so. But I just wanted to minimize all risk. But I, I wanted to also sustain chances. And that's what I, what I didn't do in the Ecobian game, which was at, in 2009. I just was so, not afraid, afraid is the wrong word, but I just was so hesitant to muddy the waters and make it complex and uh, allow sacrifice, whatever. That I just, the pieces all came off and it was immediately just dead equal. Here, I had my chances. Black really, if we just go back throughout the, the game, I mean, for the last like 40 moves, we're shuffling pieces. White is slowly improving. Black was just sitting back and hoping that he wasn't losing. So I didn't win the game. I didn't win first place. But I, I mean, I guess I'm uh, content enough to show you, you know, games I don't win, but have a strong moral. And that is that you, know, you do need to put yourself uh, in a position to win, but you don't have to go crazy doing so. Um, I've had games definitely that I've lost. I mean, I, now that I've been reflecting and I've been thinking about this lecture for a couple weeks now, um, I've had games where, as white, I just like I'm going to crush you because I need to win this game, and then I just lose really like a child. Um, and I can think of a very uh, number of examples like that in the World Open. I was six out of eight. I really wanted to win. I was playing Ilya Smirin, who's a very strong grandmaster. And I was white, and he just really just beat me so soundly, and it was awful feeling. And I, you know, I, I come to realize, like, you know, the best way to win isn't always playing for a win. And that sounds counterintuitive, but the best way to win is by playing good moves and by creating uh, hardships for your opponent, by thinking of strategies and really preventing your opponent from necessarily have the active play that they'd want. And so for me, it was a lesson learned kind of the hard way. Again, the 2009 U.S. Championship. Uh, I didn't. I, thought I got second place. Again, I'm so proud of myself for that. But you know, I didn't get a win. I didn't get a even really try to win. I didn't get a fight with Hikaru for that first place uh, trophy. So I, I learned that lesson the hard way. And the lesson I learned from this game, I didn't. It's not a hard lesson. I, I, I blundered in time trouble, and you know that in and of itself happens when you play long games and you're tired. But more importantly, I gave myself so many opportunities to get a W. Didn't come through, but I was very proud of the way I played. It just, you know, it, it's very nice. Uh, it's a very great feeling, to be honest, to be on that, that side when you're just slowly squeezing your opponent. And they're, 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 they're suffering. And it's not that I'm a, you know, a proponent of human suffering, but in chess, you know, we, our, our, our evil side comes out and, and we uh, enjoy it when uh, we have all the options and our opponent has none. So, I mean, I really appreciate you guys taking the time coming out here. Um, I hope you learned a bit about my mentality in chess, kind of the psychology, and you know the difficulty of heading into that last round and playing both for the big money and for uh, when you're actually below in points and trying to get your way back into the money. So thank you so much, um, and I hope you enjoyed. Mm -hmm.